Good morning, family. Welcome to the Johannesburg International Christian Church. So good to have you joining us today. My name is Dr. Andrew Smelly. This is my beautiful wife, Patrick, and we have the privilege to lead this great church. I'm looking forward to our church service today for communion. Nick and Shiloh are going to bring our hearts right to the foot of the cross Amen. as they share how the cross has inspired them yes. to be faithful in our walk with God. Amen. And then for contribution, Josh and Cecilia are going to convict our hearts and teach us how to give our best to God. It's going to be a great day in the Lord. Of course, we're getting ready for the Christmas season. And at this time, it's more than just gift giving. We got to remember the reason for the season. Amen, family. And so we're going to be celebrating our Christmas service next week. And our dear brother, Nick Witt, is going to be preaching the word. He's actually a new grandpa because, uh, of course, his daughter, Ashley, just gave birth to her son, Carter, this week. And so congratulations uh, to the family there. So good to have you joining us today. Today. We're going to continue uh, getting ready for the Christmas season as we look at Matthew chapter 2. Wise men and women seek the Lord. I hope you're seeking Him with all your heart this morning. You're very, very welcome. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Johannesburg International Christian Church Sunday Worship Service. As usual, we started off with two songs. The first song is Joy to the World, and the second song is Blessed Assurance. The lyrics are in the description section below if you want to sing along with us. We hope you're blessed with today's service and feel inspired. We love you. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let every receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and and heaven heaven nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. What fields and floors, rock hills and plains. Repeat the sound, repeat the sound in joy. Repeat the, repeat, repeat the sound in joy. No more let sin and sorrow grow. No taunts infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. For us the curse, for us, us the curse is found. For us the curse, for us, for us the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glory of his righteousness and wonders and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders and wonders of his love. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst in my sight. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. 
This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's time for prayers. Let's bow our heads as we pray to God. Dear Father, we are grateful for the gift of life. Thank you for the opportunity to see today, Father. There are lots of people who lose their lives every single day, even with the current um, virus situation in the world. But Lord, you have um, counted us worthy to be among the living, Father. It's not because we're better or we're more righteous, Lord. It's just because of your grace, which we're grateful for. And I pray, Lord, that we make best use of the time we have that you give us every single day and not take advantage of your grace, Lord. Even as we draw close to you and draw others close to you, Father. At this time, Lord, first, we want to just give you thanks for the successful de delivery of um, Carter, who is Nick's wing, Nick Wynn's um, grandson. Thank you, Father, for just how you walked through the process, O oh Lord, and he came out healthy and strong and is now a source of abundant joy to his family. Please, God, continue to keep him and strengthen him, O oh Lord. At this time, Father, we just want to commit Mark into your hands, who is currently mourning the passing of his mom. Dear Father, pray, Lord, you strengthen him, O oh Lord. And I pray, Father, that you give us the wisdom to say the right words at this time that will comfort him. And I pray that he grieves righteously too. Also pray, Father, for Jeanette, who is currently also mourning the death of her sister Marie's Lord. Please, God, continue to strengthen her through this process, even as she grieves righteously. And I pray, Father, we can be a source of comfort and just a source of encouragement, Father, during this dark um, um, period, Lord. Also, Father, we just want to commit the health situation to your hands in the church and just close um, relatives around, Father. Commit, Lord, um, Chris Wooden into your hands, who was diagnosed of kidney stones. Um, dear Lord, there's nothing you can't do. We pray, Father, you just heal him of the kidney stones which he has been diagnosed of, Father. We pray, Father, for the strength of um, Auntie Sari, Lord. Continue to strengthen her even as she ages gracefully. Um, at this time, also, we commit our brother Chris Klopek and the sister church in the States, Father, who is currently in the ICU, Lord. Dear God, it sounds like a dark situation, but Father, for you, we know there is nothing so difficult for you to do. And I pray, Lord, that you perfect your healing. You give the doctors wisdom, Lord, to be able to address whatever situation is currently going through, Lord. And it comes out strong and healthy, Father. Also commit Musa's grammar into your hands, O oh Lord, and um, Nick's friend Elise into your hands. Please, God, just heal them, perfect your healing in their lives, Father, and also draw them close to you as you heal them spiritually, Father. Also, we pray, we beg you for um, a vaccine for the um, coronavirus situation. Please, God, let a vaccine, vaccine be made available for us so we can live at ease in this country, Lord. But I pray that even before the vaccine comes out, Lord, that we can be wise with the way we live our lives 
exercising caution and not being prideful, but being humble in the way we live our lives, Father, during this period, Lord. And I also want to just beg you for the harvest, Lord. Um, the few days to the end of the year, Father, we know, Lord, you can still work miracles in the lives of people, Father, who are truly seeking you. Lord, lead us to them, Lord, that we can bring them into your house, Father, to have a genuine relationship with you. And I also beg you for those who are studying the Bible right now, Lord, please continue to walk in your heart, even as we plant seeds and water it, Lord. Father, you are the one who makes you grow, Father. So I pray that, Lord, whatever is going to prevent them, Father, from getting into the waters of baptism and getting united with you, Lord. Take it out of the way, Father. And I pray, Lord, it can be urgent about getting united with you, Father. We know, Lord, the miracles are in your hands and we totally trust you, not based on what we, we say or what we do, Lord. You are the one who has the power to move the hearts of people, Father. And I just pray, Lord, Father, for the holiness of the church. I mean, during this Christmas period, there's a tendency, Father, for the world to get wild. But I pray that, Lord, we can set an example of holiness to the world and we exercise caution with the way we live our lives, we'll be wise with the way we live our lives. That will be a light to this world, even during this period, Father, and for the rest of our lives, Father. Help us, Lord, to set ourselves apart from this world, Father, and also be an example of your grace to the world, Father. Also, just bring in a special request, um, the visa process currently for the Nigerians in the church, Lord. We pray that, Lord, you just take control of um, everything. You've always been there for us, Father. I know this is not going to be a different case. And I know everything is going to just move smoothly, Lord. And we're just so grateful, Father, for everything. Be with the rest of the service, Lord. Um, we pray that, Lord, you just take control of the contribution sharing, Lord. We pray that our hearts are drawn towards giving sacrificially, Father. Pray, Father, for the communion message, Lord, that, Father, our hearts are drawn to the cross and we remember the death of your son, Jesus Christ, which would move us, Lord, to continue giving our hearts in love to your service, Lord. And I also pray, Father, for just the, the message, Lord. I pray it moves our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, it draws us closer to you and convicts us, Father, to be more righteous, Lord, and more willing to give our hearts to your kingdom, O Lord. Build the rest of the service, O Lord. We are grateful, Father, for everything. Take control, Lord. We love you so much. For in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Good morning, family. Uh, just a beautiful morning. Just really grateful to be here and just thankful to be able to uh, do the communion message with my sister Shiloh Pollard. Before Shiloh shares just what the cross means to her, um, I'd like to read an incredible passage in Matthew chapter 26. And this is the account of Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane and just really opening up. And we really see Jesus being vulnerable. Read with me as we read in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 30, 39. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And these are dramatic scenes. This is the Son of God, God himself on earth. You know, I, I, I can picture the movie just falling to his knees taking his close friends with him and asking them to be there to assist in prayer. And it said that he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
And I know that many times in my own life, I felt that way. And I'm sure that every single one of us watching this message this morning, either you're feeling that way right now or you have before. You know, it is, it's challenging to be around. It is challenging on earth. We, we suffer loss. We suffer death. We, um, just many things go wrong in people's lives. This is the nature of being a human on earth. And Jesus shows us the way through vulnerability, just how to deal with our sorrow and with our pain. And it's at this time that I'd like to ask my dear sister Shiloh to just share what the cross and this passage means to her. Thank you, Shiloh. Good morning, family. I hope that everyone is having a great morning. I would like to thank Andrew and Patrick for giving me this opportunity to share my heart for communion and to share what the cross means to me. You know, this morning, what the cross means to me is breaking my silence. You know, I appreciate the scripture that Nick read in Matthew because I felt so inspired by how Jesus broke his silence about his pain to Peter in the two sons of Zebedee. You know, it took me 30 years to realize how long I've suffered in silence. For most of my life, my pain was kept silent. The trauma I experienced in my childhood and the pain I felt in my early 20s affected me in ways I never could have imagined. In the last two months, I've been able to unravel layers on top of layers of pain, hurt, anger, and unresolved issues. Unraveling different parts of my past actually helped me to see how broken and wounded I've been all these years. You know, at an early age, I learned how to shut off my emotions and pretend like everything was perfect. On the outside, life appeared beautiful, but on the inside, life was frightening, heartbreaking, and unpredictable. You know, behind closed doors, my home at times felt like a war zone. And as a little girl behind those closed doors, I was screaming for help. You know, I learned quickly as a little girl that my dad had two sides. One minute, my dad was my hero. He was affectionate. He would tell me how much he loved me and how beautiful I am. He would take me out to restaurants, give me money to go shopping with my friends, push me to be my best in sports and dance and school. He trained me to be disciplined and punctual. He celebrated all my birthdays and attended all my graduations and supported my dreams and goals. But then the other side of my dad was narcissistic and very abusive. <sighs> you know, I was around five years old when I saw my dad put a gun to my mom's head. I remember my siblings and I screaming and begging and crying for my dad to not kill my mom. I was around eight years old when I witnessed my dad grabbing my sister by her neck and strangling her with his bare hands because she stepped in to protect my mom from being abused. You know, I felt terrified, distressed, and confused about my dad's actions. I couldn't understand how he can go from being kind and generous to being mean and, abu and abusive. You know, I remember having to go to school with this confusion and fear, pretending like everything was fine and normal. I felt ashamed and afraid to share with anyone about the abuse because I knew if I did, I would be in trouble. So I kept it hidden, suffered in silence, and started to make up a false reality of my childhood to cope with the pain. You know, by the time I became a true Christian in 2013, at the age of 23, I had no idea that the pain from my childhood was still affecting me. And I also had no idea that after becoming a Christian, I would face more excruciating pain. Eight months later as a Christian, in my fourth year in college, I received a phone call that my dad suddenly and unexpectedly died. My heart broke into pieces and I didn't know how to bring those broken pieces to God and grieve righteously. So I suffered in silence and started to grieve unrighteously by numbing. When I moved to South Africa in 2019, I didn't realize how disconnected I was from God. 
By 2019, my grief had already formed into pride and blinded me from seeing God's love and the truth about myself. However, for the first time ever, I started to work through my grief in parts of my trauma. In year 2020, I allowed myself to finally see how much my grief affected me and how much my childhood impacted me in negative ways. You know, because of my childhood trauma, grief and other painful experiences, I became a prideful, arrogant and idolatrous woman. I wanted to be in control and it was very difficult for me to trust people. I became a perfectionist, wanting, not wanting to make mistakes. I became fearful of death and distrustful of God's plans for my life. I was unloving, emotionally immature and ungrateful. I would give the silent treatment when I got hurt and emotionally lashed out. In the last two months, I had the privilege to work on my character, be open about the pain I forgot about and cry about the trauma I experienced. You know, I'm so grateful that God gave my pain a voice and used my pain and suffering to rescue me and lead me to the truth. You know, the truth about my childhood, the truth about myself, the truth about my painful grief experiences and the truth about who I've become because of my pain. You know, something that I learned this year is pain that is kept silent will kill you slowly. You know, I wanna encourage and challenge the ladies this morning. You know, one, what are some past experiences, trauma and pain you've suffered in silence? Two, your past affects you more than you think. And if you don't take time to heal from it, it will destroy you, it's just a matter of time. Three, allow your pain to lead you to the truth, truth about yourself, truth about your childhood, truth about painful experiences, and truth about who you've become because of the pain. Give your pain a voice and be open with your spiritual mentor about your pain, just like Jesus did. You know, Jesus didn't keep silent about his pain and suffering. He was, he was open about it and brought his pain to God. After Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had the courage and the bravery to go to the cross and die on my behalf. Jesus didn't have to die for me or my sins, but I believe he died for me so that my pain can lead me to the truth, so that my pain can be healed, so that my pain could save me from what could have killed me spiritually in silence. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my heart. Wow. Thank you so much, Shiloh, for just sharing what this incredible passage means to you and how you can relate. You know, it's no use keeping our pain and our sorrows to ourselves. It's no use keeping it in. We've got to be open and vulnerable, just like Jesus. Have you often wondered why this, this is written so specific and so clear? I think it was to show us the vulnerability of Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, but so that we can relate because, again, as I said earlier, and as Shiloh pointed out, we all go through similar things. And we've got to share our pain and we've got to be open. And the best way to do this is to, to really connect with the cross, to really uh, be at the foot of the cross with Jesus as he suffered. You know, we'll never go through that same suffering. And that's the great thing is Jesus can relate. So I pray this morning that you'll just be more open. This will be an opportunity for you just to get, get open about where you're at and deal with your pain so that God can comfort you. And he's given us an incredible church where we can experience that comfort together. It's at this time that I want to pray for the bread and the juice that we'll be taking together afterwards. Let us pray. Father Almighty, I just want to thank you and give you glory, not for the pain and the suffering that Jesus went through, but for, for the reward of hope, because he endured that suffering, Father. And, and if, if, we're not, if we're not working through our pain and our suffering before you and before those in the church, there won't be healing, God. There won't be that resurrection to a new life. 
And I pray that we can take the scripture seriously and just really connect with the heart of Jesus as he would have wanted us to. Father, as we take the, the bread which symbolizes the body of Jesus, uh, that you just bless it to our bodies and heal us, Father. And I pray for the cup of juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was spilt on the cross for the forgiveness of every wicked thing we ever committed. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Take a look on the mountain. Tell me what do you see? As you look upon the cross at a place called Calvary. It's a place we all must go. Find the truth all man must know Where the Son of God upon a tree Change the face of history Take a look on the mountain Tell me what do you see As you look upon a cross at a place called Calvary. See the nails in his hands, see the darkness of the land, hear the voice he said that he's to blame, hear him call his father's name. Take a look on the mountain, tell me what do you see? As you look upon a cross at the place called Calvary. It's a place where love is true, where the light of God shines true. Though we fight against his blood that's poured, our trembling lips will soon say, Lord, take a look on the mountain. Tell me what do you see as you look upon the cross at the place called Calvary. All right, family, we have now come to the time of contribution. It's great. Every week we get to give back to God a little bit of what he's already given to us. And so the members of the church have taken up a pledge, a promise which we can give to God weekly. For those of you watching with us online, visiting, please feel free to give as well. The details have been provided. Today, our incredible sister Cecilia is going to be sharing about what sacrificial giving means to her. Before she shares, we're going to read this passage in Luke chapter 16, verses 10 to 14. It reads, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. This is an amazing passage. It reminds us that we can't serve both God and money. We must be devoted to God. We cannot fool ourselves. The world wants the best of both but we can't. Even the religious leaders, as this shows, the Pharisees had an issue with this. Want the best of both. I pray that we don't have an issue. I pray that we understand that God deserves our full and total devotion. And part of how we show that devotion is with our giving. The heart in which we give and our willingness to do it um, in a sacrificial manner. 
You know, so family, I pray that we can be proven trustworthy men and women today and in the, in the rest of our lives with the way we give. At this time, our dear sister Cecilia is going to be sharing with us about what this passage means to her. Thank you, Joshua. Good morning. I would like to thank Andrew and Patrick for allowing me this opportunity to share for contribution. With the challenges of the pandemic, with our economy being affected, I found myself to be one of the people affected financially. In May, my boss called a meeting to let us know that we have lost 70% of our revenues, therefore our salaries will decrease by 20%. I started to worry because that meant I needed to adjust my budget and cut off some things. As I was adjusting to that, two months later, I get an SMS from work saying that I will be getting half of my salary this month and the other half will be paid progressively in the days to come. That meant I will be getting my salary in pieces. I started to worry more because I have bills to pay I need to have money for transport, pay school fees, buy food in the house. But this scripture convicted my heart to give my contribution even when I have nothing. If I cannot be trusted with the little that God has given me, I cannot be trusted with much. I give cause I trust God even when I don't know if I will get money or not. I do not have much, but God has allowed me to be able to give. I am so grateful because God has been so faithful that I have never missed a meal or went to bed hungry. Giving is a matter of the heart. It doesn't matter if I have money or not, how much I have. If my heart is not right, I will struggle to give. Giving has helped my heart to be grateful and to give out of faith. Sisters, do you give out of comfort or sacrifice? Do you give because you trust God? Thank you. Wow, Cecilia, thank you so much, my dear sister. Just sharing with us your, your convictions and just the story about how you had to go through all of those things, rebudget and rescheme your thinking and work in your heart to hold on to your convictions and give to God. You know, family, what an amazing example. And it's so true that during this time, there's many financial hardships going throughout the world. And a lot of people are rescheming and rebudgeting but how many people are keeping their focus on God? I appreciate Cecilia being open about how she had to fight uh, to make sure that she still gave God her best. And I pray that family, we can be found trustworthy as well this morning in our giving and throughout our life so that God truly can bless us with the true riches which he desires for us on earth and in heaven. With that, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, hi God, we just thank you. Uh, it's really great just being able to give back to you. Who are we that we get to be a piece of the puzzle of the way you take care of all the needs and continue to, to make sure that all of us are, are taken care of. God, thank you so much just for, for being trustworthy. And I pray that we as men and women, that uh, if we desire to be uh, men and women of you, that we can be trustworthy as well. That we can give with a full and sincere heart, uh, not holding back. Uh, being wise and being sacrificial in the way we live, in the way we give, God. I know that Jesus preached so much about money because it's a thing that's so dear to the heart and it can pull us away. But I pray, God, that we all stay faithful, we all stay focused and magnetized to you and your word. Um, God, we love you. We thank you so much. Please be with the rest of the service. Bless our hands as we give this morning. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, family. Christmas time is here, and there's only 18 days until the start of 2021. We're almost there. Amen, family. You're praying. Uh, but it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, although the, the COVID restrictions are going to affect the opportunity to spend time with family and friends, I, I pray that we remember the reason for the season. Our Christmas service next week will actually feature a guest speaker, our dear brother and ministry intern for the church, Mr. Nicholas Wynn. And uh, Nick will be preaching on the important topic as we enter the holidays entitled, Set Apart for God's Glory. 
This past week has been an exciting one for Nick and Tommy Sorry as uh, his daughter Ashley gave birth to his new grandson Carter last Tuesday. And so, uh, Nick, Tommy Sorry, we celebrate with you. Uh, so encouraging. So good to have a little bit more testosterone in the house there, too, bro. Amen. Amen. Well, turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. You know, more than uh, 2,000 years ago, men from the east gazed upon the heavens, and they were drawn to a star. They were compelled by something beyond themselves to follow the light of this star and discover the fulfillment of a prophecy, a prophecy about the Messiah who would come to redeem mankind of their sins. Well, let's read here in Matthew chapter 2. Let's pick it up in verse 1. The Bible reads, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Amen. Well, this is incredible, right? Now, what's interesting here is that Unlike the joyful spirit surrounding all the gift giving that the Christmas season can bring, here, all of Jerusalem was disturbed at the news of the Messiah's birth. Herod was disturbed because he felt threatened, threatened by his position as the king of the Jews. And the Jewish people were probably alarmed that the arrival of Jesus would reveal the nature of their stubborn hearts and rebellious lives. They were aware of the prophecy from the prophet Micah over 700 years earlier, which spoke about a ruler, the Christ, who would shepherd the people of God. As we prepare to enter the holiday season, we need to help more people to be disturbed in a righteous way about the truth of repentance and baptism in the Christ so they truly can celebrate the reason for the season. The title of the message today is simply, Wise Men Seek the Lord. Wise Men Seek the Lord. And I dare say, wise sisters too, amen? Wise women too, amen? Come on. Well, we're talking about the Magi today. And of course, the Magi were also known as wise men, also traditionally called that. And they were actually pagan astrologers, pagan astrologers who heard about the prophecy of this future king of the Jews and sought to find him. The first reference of the Magi is in Daniel chapter 4, verse 7, and chapter 5, verse 7, in the Amplified Version, which states that the Magi were enchanters, uh, master astrologers, and diviners at the court of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And so it's ironic that these pagan men were more eager to discover the truth than the religious Jews of that day. Sometimes people are, even people from a pagan background, are more humbled by life and eager to search for the truth 
than those who are comfortable in their religious traditions. Well, if you're our guest with us this morning, how eager are you to seek the truth of the Lord? Or are you just using this time, the Christmas season time, to just celebrate the holiday season through gift giving? Are you with me here? Let's keep reading. Matthew chapter 2, picking it up in verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, quote, Out of Egypt I called my son. Wow. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Okay, let's pause here. You know, this passage really describes the intense persecution of Jesus Christ from the time he was, quote unquote, born into this earthly world. Yet his father in heaven just continued to keep watch over him. From his earthly birth, Jesus was in danger of being killed because of Herod's persecution. And Joseph and Mary were warned to escape to Egypt and become refugees there before they could return to Jerusalem. Their actions actually fulfilled a prophecy from the prophet Hosea mentioned in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, about God calling his son out of Egypt. Sadly, Herod's massacre of Jewish babies here was similar to the genocide and mass murder of Hitler's Nazi Germany. It was intense. And so it was into this horrific environment that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, entered this earthly world. That's far from the, the peaceful depictions on holiday cards that people like to buy to encourage each other for Christmas. Well, sadly, our society is very ignorant of the purpose of Jesus' birth and the circumstances that accompanied it. As a result, they're more concerned about giving gifts than actually meditating on the reason for Jesus' birth to turn people back to God. Let's take a look here in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Let's read what was said concerning the arrival of Jesus into this world. We're going to pick it up here in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25. The Bible states here, Now there was a man in Jerusalem named or called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation or the deliverance of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. Wow. See, this, this is why people were disturbed about the birth of Jesus. They knew hearts would be revealed through Jesus' coming because he was the sword of the Spirit, the very word of God. Well, family, if you're our guest today, what needs to be revealed in your heart through the scriptures? Are you afraid to discover, like Herod and the religious people of that time, that Jesus may not actually be the Lord of your life. Let's get back to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. You know, many of us have seen uh, the manger scenes at Christmas time and 
uh, that have the wise men positioned somewhere near Jesus' manger bearing gifts, right? Uh, traditionally, there have been three, quote unquote, wise men kneeling beside the manger to worship the, the baby Jesus, right? Uh, who had just been born. But that interpretation is not biblically accurate. The scriptures do not tell us how many wise men there were, um, although tradition and Christmas songs state that there were three. The song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, you guys have heard that song before? Yeah, I'm sure you have. Uh, it, it's simply a traditional song. And so Luke chapter two, actually verses eight to 20, states that there were shepherds. There were shepherds living nearby who were visited by the angelic host and came to worship Jesus. Now, if the Magi had arrived at the night of Jesus' birth, they would have had to be on like jet propelled camels because they came from hundreds of miles away. Are you with me here? Okay, so many people confuse the arrival of the shepherds at Jesus' birth with the arrival of the Magi who came later. In reality, many scholars believe that the Magi didn't arrive in Jerusalem until about two years after the birth of Jesus. And we see it from the scriptures here. In Matthew chapter two, Verse 11, we see that the scriptures call Jesus a child, not a baby, right? Um, and he was in a house, not a manger. You see that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Also in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, we see that um, it implies that the Magi had come about two years after Jesus' birth because after the Magi's meeting with Herod, he now ordered that all the boys in Jerusalem who were two years old or a younger were to be killed. You get it, right? It's pretty clear there. So you can just imagine how intense this time was. I mean, if you think we're living in crazy times now, imagine that this, this was just a wicked, evil time, right? And as we prepare for the Christmas season, the goal of today is to really help us discover the reasons of how and why the Magi sought the Lord so we can apply their wisdom to our lives. Their unwavering purpose is actually recorded here in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, where they say, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. You see, if you're our guest here today, have you seen the light from God's word, which is Christ? And are you really here to worship him? Or are you more like Herod? and the Jews, who had a form of godliness, but wanted to keep living their sinful lives and deny the power of God. Well, today we're going to discover the true reason for the season as we examine the text today in Matthew 2 in deeper detail. Let's read this again. Matthew chapter 2, picking it up in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where's the one? who has been born king of the Jews, we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. Okay, point number one today. Are you ready? Point number one, wise men and women, amen. Wise men seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious time. Mm, yes, wise men and women seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious time. You know, it's important. Sometimes we can just read over stuff and not realize, right? It's important to understand the effort and sacrifice that the Magi exerted to find the Lord. Because of a similar reference to wise men in Daniel chapter 4 and 5 that I mentioned earlier, most scholars believe that the Magi traveled all the way from Babylon to Jerusalem. Are you with me here? And so remember, Babylon is the place where the Jews had been exiled about 500 years previously, and where the prophet Daniel had served as a slave and later as an administrator for four different kings over 60 years. And so perhaps Daniel um, had been such a spiritual influence on those around him that the hope and desire for the coming Messiah had carried down through the generations. You know, it's, it's powerful to realize that our efforts today can make an impact, a spiritual impact on our families, our friends, and our communities for that, that makes a difference for the years to come. I mean, that, that's what every parent, every parent who's a disciple wants to do, right? Wanna, wants to put the heart of God into their children, who will put that into their children, who will put that into their children. 
Are you with me here, fam? Now, according to Ezra chapter 7, verse 9, it would have taken at least four months, okay? Four months to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem. You can only imagine the caravan right there, right? Uh, all the things you needed to, to just make it. Four months. Now, we know that the scripture in Ezra 7 verse 9, it states, He, Ezra, had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. Okay, so the only mode of travel, right, the only mode of travel at this time was to walk or ride on a certain type of animal, like a camel. Now, it's interesting, 40 years after the birth of Jesus, the Ethiopian eunuch, who was actually in a chariot, right, in Acts chapter 8, also saw the need to take his precious time to travel in a chariot over 2,200 kilometers to seek the Lord at the Jewish temple. And so how important is seeking God to you? I mean, is it worth your time? Do you just give a couple hours on Sunday and then the rest of the week go back to your other priorities? I mean, how, 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 how much time do you honestly give the Lord? The truth is, we all have a biological clock, a biological clock which is going to run out. Why is it that many people just don't seek God until they've been humbled greatly by illness or misfortune? in their lives. We don't know when our time on earth is going to end. Are we really making the most of every opportunity? Take a look with me over in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. You know, recently our hearts really mourn just with our brother Mark at the passing of his mother, Harriet, um, just two weeks ago due to complications from COVID-19. And she was only 48 years old. She became ill on a Monday and died the following Sunday. I mean, it's tragic. I, I, I remember when my mom passed of cancer back in 2008. And Mark, our hearts are with you, my brother. We mourn with you. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a loss that is so painful. I know our sister Jeanette understands this, was just losing her sister, our younger sister Marie's recently. But ask yourself, what if you knew you were going to die in a week's time? How would you live your life? Take a look in Isaiah 55. Let's pick it up here in verse 6. The Bible reads, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Amen to that. You know, since COVID-19 began, over a million people in the world have lost their lives. I recently read about an NBA a uh, basketball player in the U.S. who lost seven members of his family to COVID-19. Are you seeking God while you still have the opportunity? It's time to forsake just your empty way of life and the unrighteous thoughts and actions. God wants to pardon you before it's too late. Take a look over in 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Are you disturbed? Or are you just jolly because you get to pass gifts around during the holidays? Are you disturbed if you don't really seek after God? Are you disturbed because you know there are parts of your life you haven't dealt with? There's sin you're still committing. Are you disturbed? You know, God wants to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Let's take a look here in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2. The Bible reads, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. What are you doing today to make a difference for your soul? 
You know, I've often heard the quote, don't wait for six strong men in black to take you to church. Well, of course, this is referring to being carried to your funeral in a coffin by the pallbearers. Family, the time to seek God's favor is now. And we, and we need to stop taking God's grace for granted and, and, and become self-deceived into thinking that those who reject God's truth are going to be okay. It's, it's simply not true. Take a look over in Isaiah 57. Isaiah chapter 57. This is what the Bible says here. Isaiah 57. You know, um, when loved ones die, I often hear people say, uh, may you rest in peace. May she rest in peace. Um, that disturbs me. Because if they're not a baptized disciple, it's simply not true. You see, people say rest in peace to make themselves and make others feel better. But in reality, for our loved ones who die, it's very different if they've not responded to the grace of God by repenting of their sins and becoming true baptized disciples of Jesus Christ. Consider the words of the prophet Isaiah here. Isaiah 57, picking it up in verse 14. The Bible says here, And it will be said, Build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You know, do you have a contrite heart, a broken, remorseful heart for your sins? I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry. For when the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created, I was enraged by a sinful greed. I punished him and hid my face in anger, yet he kept on in his willful ways. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. Verse 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. You know, this passage is comforting, but yet also disturbing. See, before we became true disciples of Jesus, our sins made us wicked. That's who we are. No matter how nice you think people are, people still commit, they lie, they cheat, they steal, they lust, they greed, they're deceitful, they give in to their anger and rage. Family, that's wickedness. It's terrible. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Do you consider your sins to be wicked? Or do you think just murder and rape are the only sins in the world today? You know, it's remarkable though, from this passage, just to see that the grace and the patience of God, despite the, the sinful ways of the world, the message here is clear. Those who reject God's grace and mercy will not rest in peace. It's Troubling to hear, disturbing to hear, but it's the truth. One of the reasons why I gave up uh, aspirations for a medical career is because I wanted to be used by God to proclaim the truth in a world of false doctrine, where so many people are being led astray and deceived. Loved ones that I know, led astray and deceived. You know, God graciously gives us time to seek him. But people choose not to follow him or acknowledge that they were created by him and for his purpose. God desires everyone to be saved if they're broken, if they're contrite in heart and, and willing to remove the obstacles that stop them from obeying the truth. Yet, despite his willingness to heal them from their sins, people continue their sinful ways. They have a form of godliness, but deny it's God's power. Is your time too precious to see the truth, to sit down and have a Bible study and apply it to your life? Do you not have enough time for your soul? 
What is more precious than your soul? If you choose to be indifferent towards God's mercy and grace, do not deceive yourself about the truth when your time on this earth comes to an end. You know, I appreciate friends like Jason and Desmond who, despite busy schedules, right, are studying the Bible almost every day with the brothers. You know, please pray for them that they can get united with the Lord soon. Amen? But you see, the Magi, they chose to sacrifice their time, traveling four months at least, because they understood their spiritual darkness. They understood that, and they were looking for God's light of redemption. Apparently, these men were actually familiar with the ancient prophecy that spoke about Jesus all the way back in Numbers 24. Let's take a quick look there. It's pretty cool. In Numbers 24, in the first part of verse 17, uh, the Bible says here, Numbers 24, verse 17, Balaam's fourth oracle here, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Wow. Okay. So the star and scepter were symbolic for the power and rule of the Messiah. Pretty cool, huh? Another prophecy that spoke about the light of this star was found in a prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 60. Let's take a quick look there. Isaiah chapter 60. In verse 1 to 3, the Bible says here, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Wow, pretty awesome there. Thinking about the Magi, huh? And so the birth of Jesus was the light and the glory of the world. And his arrival would allow the Gentile nations to come and know God because of him. You know, I'm excited because uh, 2021, for our movement of churches worldwide, our theme for 2021 is mountain moving faith. And in the Old Testament, mountains were symbolized nations, right? In the Old Testament. So we're excited to be able to reach more nations next year for the Lord. Are you with me here? Right now, there are over 8,000 disciples on all six populated continents of the world. And God willing, we're excited to go for 10,000 for the Lord next year. Are you with me here? We want to reach 10,000 disciples for the Lord. Be praying for that as we reach more and more nations for God. Even here on the continent of Africa, we'll be praying, we're praying for Brazzaville, Republic of Congo to be planted, Yaoundé, uh, Cameroon to be planted and by 2021. And God willing, by 2022, 2023, we're praying for you, God, and we're praying for Kenya. Amen, family. We got to thank God to move the nations to seek him. Well, turn over to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. All right, you found it? All right, good. Here we go. Zechariah chapter 8. Let's pick it up here. Starting in verse 1. This is pretty cool about how the Lord promises to bless Jerusalem. It says here in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible reads, Again, the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. Right? God doesn't want to share his people with the world. Right? This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. Amen to that. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. Come on. Amen. Now, of course, you know, in the Old Testament, mountains also not only symbolize nations, but also like God's people, his church. And so this, this is pretty cool right here, right? Um, but how amazing is this? God's prophecy to Zechariah was to return to Zion, dwell in Jerusalem, which he did in the form of Jesus, right? Let's pick it up in verse 7. The Bible reads here, This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I'll be faithful and righteous to them as their God. Amen to that. God, See, God is always desired to save his people from countries of the East and the West, both pagans and the religious, Jews and Gentiles, like the Magi of Babylon. Let's 
pick it up in verse 20. This is what Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. You know, as we're building God's church, his mountain, right? His kingdom here in Johannesburg. This is the Jerusalem church for all of Africa. And I'm praying for the day where folks will come from Uganda, from Kenya to train here before getting sent on out to plant those great nations. This has got to be the training center to be able to build God's house so that missionaries can go throughout, not just Southern Africa, but throughout the continent. Are you with me here, family? It's incredible what we're a part of. Well, I look at this and I realize, wow, you know, in um, this passage, we see that we have all these people coming, powerful people, powerful nations coming, and important people with important priorities made the time because they knew what was at stake. Are you ready to, as the Bible says in verse 21, let us go at once to entreat the Lord. Are you ready to go at once to seek the Lord and receive his favor? The time is now, family. Get together with the person who invited you today and study the Bible. If you don't, you're choosing, you're making a choice. You, you gotta understand that. Indifference is still a decision, right? If you don't, you're choosing. You're choosing to ignore the truth and take God's grace in vain. And so you will not rest in peace when your time on earth is over. And that will be no one's fault except your own. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter two. Matthew chapter two. All right, so point number one, wise men seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious time. Are you sacrificing your time today to get closer to God and his word? Point number two, wise men seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious traditions. All right, Matthew chapter two, starting here in verse three, wise men seek the Lord and women, amen, seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious traditions. Let's pick it up here in verse three. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. <laughs> Wise men seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious traditions. Well, what do we see here? Apparently, it seems like only the wise men were actually looking out for the star that had been prophesied. <laughs> These pagan astrologers had sacrificed their time and now also sacrificed their traditions. Because remember, they, were, they used to follow divination and astrology, right? But they sacrificed those quote-unquote precious traditions to seek the truth. Sadly, even though the chief priests and the teachers of the law knew the scriptures, they did not have the humility of the Magi to apply it to their lives. Herod himself acted like he wanted to worship Jesus, but in actuality, he just wanted to destroy him. His search for God, Herod's search for God, was not sincere. It was actually due just to his own self-protection and pride. Are you, this morning, protecting your religious traditions? Are you rejecting the, the truth of repentance and baptism in the Christ? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Because you want to protect your precious way of thinking and the traditions of your family. Perhaps you think that your tradition will save you, or you're not willing to accept that those who have already died, sadly, who are not true baptized disciples and are not resting in peace, um, and because you're not willing to accept that, you choose to be sentimental and believe a lie rather than accept the truth of God's word. That's not gonna help anyone. 
it's not like you're going to change anything. Take a look over in Mark chapter 7. I used to tell people all the time, funerals are not for the dead. They're for the living. Funerals are all about inspiring people. Of course, inspiring them about the life of the person that passed, but inspiring people to turn to God before it's too late. To understand that death is the destiny of every person on the face of the earth. The question is where their soul is going to be. Well, here in Mark chapter 7, let's pick it up in verse 5. Let's see what Jesus has to say about these precious traditions that people like to follow. In Mark chapter 7, picking it up in verse 5, the Bible reads, So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with, quote-unquote, unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. You know, we talked about this last week with the counterfeit miracles, wonders, and signs in many false doctrine churches today. The wickedness of ancestor worship. Family, what, th that's not the Bible. You can't combine biblical truth with false traditions from our culture. It's simply wrong. Are you choosing to rely on your own understanding or your cultural understanding rather than the word of God? Is your culture going to save you? Are these traditions going to save you when you stand before God? Do not be mistaken. When you choose to do that, you are setting aside the commands of God and holding on to the traditions of the world. The Apostle Paul also speaks about the danger of pride and religiosity as he speaks to the Jewish uh, leaders in Acts chapter 28. Let's pick up there. Pick it up there. Acts chapter 28. Let's pick it up here in verse 23. Again, Paul speaking to these Jewish leaders. Let's see what happens. Acts 28, picking it up in verse 23. The Bible reads, They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day, and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, hey, come on, Paul, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God, God's church, and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed along among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, quote, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused, just hardened. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Amen. For all the Gentiles, amen. Well, where are you today? Are you hearing, but not understanding? Have you hardened your hearts to God's word? Some of the religious leaders in this passage made the decision not to believe. And these are Jewish religious leaders. Would it shock you to know that many quote-unquote pastors today, here in South Africa and all over the world, do not believe that the Bible is a true inspired word of God? Would that shock you? Would it shock you to, to believe that there are pastors today that do not even hold to the Bible's teachings in its entirety? I mean, look at the world today. You got homosexual marriages, you got all these different sins that are even accepted by quote unquote churches. People aren't actually interested in holding to the word of God. They just want to hold to popular opinion. Are you with me here, family? 
If you're our guest this morning, are you listening to change your relationship with God? Or are you just going through a religious ritual? The amazing thing is, is that if you hold to the word of God, you can change. I, I've seen so many people repent of the wicked sins of rage and deceit and lust, homosexuality, all these different things. You can change if you hold to the word of God. You can start fresh and be washed clean in the blood of Jesus at baptism. Family, we need to heed Paul's admonishment here and accept the truth. God has given you the time and the opportunity to hear his message. The question is what we're going to do. The Apostle Paul also shared earlier to the crowds about his conversion in Christ. Because again, a lot of people are just confused. They think, oh, I'm just going to pray a prayer to be saved or speak in tongues to be saved or just go to church and wear a cross around my neck to be saved. That's not what the Bible says. Let's take a look in Acts chapter 22. As Paul um, shares his conversion in Christ through the efforts of a disciple named Ananias. Acts chapter 2, let's pick it up here in verse 14. Ananias is speaking to uh, Paul and he says, Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. How much more clearer is that? See, family, if you're a guest here today, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Not as a symbol after you think you've gotten saved months or a year later. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. That's not biblical baptism. You need to study the Bible and understand what point in time does that wall of sin get broken down in your life? What point in time does Jesus circumcise your sin? Colossians 2, 11 and 12. You better know, because if you don't know, then you don't know the word of God. You see, if you haven't been baptized as a true disciple of Jesus Christ, then you're not biblically a Christian. No matter what Anyone for us to tell you, whether it be some church that you grow up going to, it, it doesn't matter. What does the Bible say? It's not about your tradition. It's not about your culture. We're, this is not uh, Africana church or a Zulu church. This is a Bible church. Are you with me here, family? And we got to have deep convictions on the scriptures. Family, if you are just seeking to justify yourself, or justify your tradition, then you're not holding to the word of God. Take a look over in 1 Timothy here. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. The Bible says here, Watch your life and doctrine. What you believe about salvation and matters of God closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save. Oh, so this is a salvation issue. This isn't just something that's optional. No, no, no. It says here, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers, those who listen to you. Wow. You see, there are many people here in South Africa who claim to be quote-unquote pastors and quote-unquote men of God. <laughs> Yet they're not watching their lives and doctrine closely. They're full of hypocrisy and greed. Have you ever wondered why there's so many churches? <laughs> why there's so many churches just divided in lifestyle and their beliefs and doctrine. And, and no one says, hey, let's come together and get united. Everyone's just fine going to whatever church they want to go to, even though Jesus prayed in John 17 that believers everywhere would be brought to complete unity. No, people are just happy to go hang out with their friends, sing a couple songs, Look at a scripture or two and go home. That's not biblical Christianity. A lot of these false teachers would just rather build their own kingdoms than be united in life and doctrine with true disciples of Jesus. Turn over to Daniel chapter 12. The book of Daniel chapter 12. You know, for those of us who are baptized disciples of Jesus, amen, we know that once we understand the truth, we now need to proclaim the truth. That's how we shine. Like a star. Daniel chapter 12, picking up in verse 3. The Bible says here, Those who are wise 
will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars, forever and ever. Wow. Family, that's, that's how we shine like stars for the Lord. We can shine like Jesus did. And others will come to our light. Proverbs 11 verse 30 states that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. As disciples of Jesus, we can be wise. Wise in the sight of God. And if we're wise, we will seek to lead our unsaved family and friends to the Lord. During this Christmas season, we have to make the most of this opportunity. Are you with me here? Let's make every effort to shine like stars as we love and serve our families, sharing about how much we've repented of sin in our lives and calling them to the truth of God's word. If they desire to please the Lord, they'll be humble. They'll be teachable. That's what being a disciple is all about. A disciple is a student. Therefore, a Christian is a student. And if someone claims to be a Christian and they're not teachable, they're not willing to be humble and learn, then they're not a Christian. They're not a disciple. Take a look over in Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Let's look at the second half here of verse 2. Isaiah 66, the second half of verse 2 here, it says, This is the one I esteem. This is what God's saying. This is the one I esteem. I mean, think about that, right? Like, God respects this type of person. Are you, re are you ready to hear it? Okay. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble. Wow. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. You see, if you're a guest joining us here this morning, isn't it amazing to think that if you're humble, if you're broken about the sins in your life, if you tremble at the word of God, God says, amen. I respect that. Wow. God Almighty would respect that. Is that your heart this morning? Family, it takes great humility to get broken about our sin and to see our need to change and be taught. God will give us favor if we humble ourselves before his word. The Magi were powerful, influential men, yet they had the humility, the humility to sacrifice their time and traditions to seek the Lord and his star led them to the truth. If you're our guest today, I pray that you'll follow the quote unquote light of those who invited you and study the Bible, God's word. You know, I appreciate our brother Semo in Malawi, who he was a denominational minister there. And when we found out about him through another brother in the U.S., we were able to connect. He was able to come to Lagos, where we were in Lagos at the time. And we studied the Bible with him and baptized him. It was a great miracle. And now uh, his friend Hopeson in Blantyre is studying the Bible with us to become a true baptized disciple of Jesus. He's right there. He's, he's almost ready to be baptized. So be praying for him. God, God is working, family. But, but Semu had to sacrifice his quote-unquote precious traditions. Sacrifice all the false doctrine he knew as a denominational minister and decide to seek the light, to seek the truth of God's word. If a former minister can do that, giving up everything, how about you today? All right, let's get back to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to wrap up here pretty soon. All right, so wise men see the Lord by sacrificing what? Their precious time and their precious traditions. Point number three today is wise men and women seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious treasures. All right, let's read here Matthew chapter 2, picking it up in verse 9. The Bible states, After they, after the Magi, had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. Amen. And so, in addition to sacrificing their time and their traditions, 
the Magi also sacrificed their treasures to seek the Lord. You know, despite all the expenses involved in four months of travel, right? They still brought an offering, a gift fitting to honor a king that consisted of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, we may not have gold, frankincense, and myrrh to offer Jesus, but we need to be willing to give our best even with the little that we have. Turn over to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Let's pick it up here in verse 41 to 44. The Bible states, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. See, family, the issue is not the amount. The issue is the heart. God wants to see if we consider a relationship with him to be valuable, to be precious to us. While the world serves money, disciples of Jesus serve God first. And Romans 12, 1 states that the most precious treasure and sacrifice we can give God is a holy life. That's what pleases God the most. <laughs> Take a look over in Isaiah chapter 60. This passage in Isaiah 60 here describes an Old Testament prophecy that's related to the Magi coming bearing gifts. Isaiah 60, picking it up in verse 4. The Bible states here, Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar. Your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas we brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Amen. You know, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that camels from Midian, which boarded Moab, and people from Sheba would come, bringing gifts of gold and frankincense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The gifts of the Magi alluded to Jesus' role as God's sacrificial king born essentially to die. The gold symbolized, symbolizing a crown, uh, frankincense, which is associated with sacrifices at the altar of the temple, Leviticus 24 verse seven, and myrrh, a drink offering poured out for the benefit of others. Kind of like Mark 15 verse 23, also known as gall, which was given to Jesus on the cross. And so isn't it incredible that the gifts that the Magi brought symbolized all that Jesus had come to do. As we enter the Christmas season, a time of expectation of gifts and presents, what is your gift to the Lord today? You know, the Magi understood that their worship of the Lord required an offering. They understood that there would not be complete worship without giving their treasure. We see that in Matthew 2, verse 11. But how does that relate to you today? Can you, can you honestly say you worship Jesus when you don't give your best in regards to contribution and offerings? We spend money on frivolous things rather than spending money so that more people can hear the word of God and so be saved. You know, I appreciate our brother Bo Kong who shared powerfully last week about this fact. As a teen, as a teenager, he found a way to raise 20 times his weekly contribution towards special missions. That's powerful. Well done, my brother. He set an example in his generosity not to get the praise of men, but to bring glory to God. Why? Because... He's grateful for the kingdom. He's seen the power and the love of God through his kingdom here in Johannesburg. Turn over to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know, the Magi gave their treasures in great quantity or quality, but they also gave it in great quantity. You know, many people today give God their leftovers. That's just a sad fact, but it's true. And yet they have the audacity. To, to complain when they feel like God doesn't bless their lives abundantly. <laughs> Take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 here, picking it up in verse 17. The Bible reads, 
Command those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen to that. You see, family, we need to give our best to the Lord. He deserves it. And, and to give to God means that we give to Him all that there is of us, right? All that we have, all that we are, our time, our talents. There's a lot of talents in this church, a lot of people that aren't using their talents yet. I heard them hearing about you, <laughs> right? Our time, our talents, our treasure. What do you treasure? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's get back to Matthew 2. Matthew chapter 2. Last point today. Wise men and women seek the Lord by sacrificing precious relationships. Wise men and women seek the Lord by sacrificing precious relationships. Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. The Bible states here, And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they, the Magi, returned to their country by another route. Hmm. You see, God's warning was more important to the Magi than the desires of King Herod. They knew the value of listening to God's word over the word of others regardless of worldly position or emotional sentiments. Do you listen to God and his word more than your boss or your family? Turn over to Isaiah chapter 8. I want to show you something quickly here. It's amazing how much Isaiah has to offer us. The question is whether we're wise enough to listen to the warnings of God. Let's pick it up here in Isaiah 8. Starting in verse 11, the Bible reads, The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be a sanctuary. For both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony and seal up the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. Amen. See, family, if we fear and trust God, then we'll heed his warnings more than anyone or anything else. The word of God can often be a snare that stops people from holding to the truth. We, we have to remember, we're children of God, right? Part of his family, a sign and a symbol to the world. Turn over to Matthew 10. I've got to show you something quickly. I see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew chapter 10. You know, sadly, many people want to appease their family and desire to have a little peace at home more than obeying the truth. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew chapter 10, picking up in verse 32. Jesus states, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus' family didn't come to bring this peace, peace. He wasn't a people pleaser. He spoke the truth. He came to bring the standard of righteousness. And the truth trumps peace. During the holidays, many people just want peace, quote unquote, with their family. 
They want to please them more than honoring God's word. Their family may say, oh, let's go to some false doctrine church that's teaching false things. And they'll say, ah, okay, even though they know it's wrong. Instead of taking a stand. I remember when I came back, <laughs> after getting baptized and as a junior at Cornell University, and I saw my mom, and we were, she, she, after I came back home, she was like, you know, Andrew, let's, let's go to church. This is Presbyterian church. And I was like, Mama, I love you with all my heart, but uh, I can't go there. And now, you got to understand, I grew up in a Jamaican household, so we, they don't play. So she was like, she just looked at me, right? That look can just cut through eyes. And I was like, Mom, you, you raised me to love the truth. And sadly, that's not the truth according to God's word. And that was it. I had gone and talked to you, the pastor of that church, the elder of that church. They didn't even believe the Bible was truly the word of God. But of course, they dressed up the building nice with ribbons and bells for Christmas season. But yet they were teaching false doctrine. See, family, the reason why people don't heed the warnings of God is because they're more afraid of the world than they are of Jesus. It's cowardice, and it's, it's a lack of faith that does not please God. My mom and my dad would eventually start coming out to our church right, to come out to the kingdom of God. They started hearing me preach. They were blown away. Well, it's because I took a stand. Are you willing to take a stand? Because if you don't take a stand right now, then your family will never believe that what you're, what you're holding to is the truth. They'll just think, ah, it's just, it's a phase. I mean, he, he changes one second, she changes one second, and they bounce back and forth. Two plus two equals four. It doesn't change during Christmas season. Uh, are you with me here? Two plus two doesn't equal seven because it's Christmas. The Magi did not allow the lack of time, the traditions of the past, their financial treasures, or even the desires of a king to stop them from obeying the truth. They honored God first. And for those who are disciples of Jesus, we need to, to love and serve our families, but we cannot compromise our convictions to the truth. Do we seek first the kingdom? Do we seek first God's church? Or do we seek first to please our families? Consider the example of Jesus. Turn over to Mark 3. Mark chapter 3. This is an important passage to see. In Mark chapter 3, pick it up in verse 20. The Bible says here, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he's out of his mind. So, what did Jesus' family think? Oh, this is crazy. What is this? What are, you got? what are you doing here? And people think the same way for a true disciple. Are you part of some cult? They expect you to actually hold to the word of God and be committed? Who can do that nowadays? It's pathetic. Well, take a look over in verse 31. The Bible says here, Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Verse 33, who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. You know, a lot of people say that blood is thicker than water, right? Essentially talking that family bonds, right, are more important than anything else. But biblically, that's not true. Being part of God's spiritual family, Jesus' blood is thicker, is more powerful than any other blood. Why? Because he washes us clean of sin. We become part of God's family. Of course, we love our physical family, and we want them to be with us. Are you with me here? But at the same time, we cannot turn back on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us, dying for us so we can be redeemed of sin in order to please our family, who doesn't even share the convictions of his word? Family, Jesus is clear here. He put his spiritual family above his physical family. Why? Because they were not interested in holding to the truth at that time. The good news is that because Jesus was willing to sacrifice his precious relationships at that time and did not compromise, his family would see his conviction and become his true disciples before he ascended back up to heaven. Take a look over in Acts 1. In Acts chapter 1, let's see what the Bible says here. Acts 1 verse 10, the Bible says, 
They were looking up intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They were all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. How awesome is that? See, family, if we hold to God's word, our families, our physical families, could make it too. It's time to make some radical decisions. It's time to sacrifice the things in your life that could hold you back from following the Lord. What is really precious to you? If you claim that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, do you honor him with your time? Do you hold on to religious traditions or to the truth of God's word? Whether it be our time, our traditions, our treasures, or even our precious relationships, Family, seeking the Lord is worth it. It's time to follow the star. That is Jesus and those holding out the word of God to you. You know, Psalms 119, 105 says it best. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Like the wise men, though, I would encourage you not to travel alone. Allow other Christians in your life so to help you stay on track and lovingly warn you when danger from false friends like Herod approach. It's my prayer that the joy of your salvation will always inspire you to help others to know the Lord as well. Well, let's close today in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. You know, today there is still a star beckoning wise men and women to follow him. The star is Jesus. Let's read here Revelation chapter 12, sorry, chapter 22, picking it up in verse 12. The Bible reads here, Jesus states, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root, the offspring of David, and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I want everyone who takes, who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes the words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. And his people said, Amen. Family, Jesus, the bright morning star, is coming back. Are you seeking a relationship with him? Are you seeking a relationship with him by becoming a true baptized disciple of Jesus? No matter the challenges, let us be wise men and women who seek the Lord. This is the true reason for the season. Well, family, may God bless you as we seek to bring many to the Lord and Again, thank you so much for joining us today. From my house to yours, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Thank you and God bless you. Good morning, family. Thank you so, so much for joining us today for our worship service. And you know, I must say that I am so grateful to be part of God's kingdom. And it's an amazing kingdom. And we just see it in our worship services. And today was truly special. We had our communion message given by our dear sister Shiloh. And she shared about the importance 
of being open when you're in pain and suffering. I know sometimes when we're in pain and, and suffering, we, we tend to shrink back. Uh, we tend to keep it to ourselves, but that's so harmful. And if we're following Jesus' example, as was shared in the scriptures, we will get open about our pain and suffering just like Jesus did. He got open and he shared about his feelings. That's so important when we're suffering, when we're in pain. We need to, to give that pain a voice. And I appreciate Shiloh sharing that. Give that pain and suffering a voice. Let it express, its, its, express itself through you by talking to others. That way you can get the help you need. And in addition to sharing that pain and suffering, pray. Pray about it. Ask God to intervene. He can do anything. He can take away your pain. He can bring you joy. He can bring you peace. And he can bring you comfort. Thank you so much, Shiloh, for sharing about being open during pain and suffering. Thank you so much. Then our dear sister, Cecilia, shared for contribution. And she shared that in her job, her salary was cut due to lack of business because of COVID. And we see that happening all over. And she was struggling. She had bills. She had to feed her son and take care of other things. And she was struggling because of that. But she went to the Bible. She went to the scriptures and gained faith that she needed in order to persevere, to keep going, and mainly to build her conviction about no matter what her circumstances are, she's going to give back to God. And we truly, truly appreciate that. She didn't let the fact that her salary was cut in half. She didn't let the fact that not only was it cut in half, but a few weeks later, she wasn't getting the whole amount at one time. It was being broken up. And that really caused her hardship. But she realized from the scriptures that nothing should come between her heart of giving sacrificially. And that's what she did. She continued to give her contribution despite the cut in her salary. And God has rewarded. God has provided her because of her faith. She's not struggling. She's not missing anything because God has provided for her. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for sharing about perseverance and the importance of giving contribution, giving back to God, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what you have, you can always give to God. And then... Our dear brother, Andrew, gave an amazing message. And the message was entitled, Wise Men Seek the Lord. Wise Men Seek the Lord. And he had four points. His first point was, Wise Men Seek the Lord by Sacrificing Their Precious Time. His second point, Wise Men Seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious traditions. And his third point, wise men seek the Lord by their precious treasure. And his third point, wise men seek the Lord by sacrificing their precious relationships. And it made me think about, what am I sacrificing for God? What am I willing to do for God? 
What is going to make me wise in God's eyes? I know coming to South Africa was a huge decision and we definitely made sacrifices. We sacrificed our friends, our family, our comforts, and our finances to come here to South Africa. But I can tell you that because of those sacrifices, we have not missed a beat. We still have a place to stay. We have food on our tables. We have new friends, new relationships, and it's amazing. It just shows you that when you sacrifice for God, he's going to take care of you. He's not going to let you struggle. There may be some hard times. There may be a few struggles. But if you persevere, God's going to take care of you. You're not going to go hungry. I guarantee you that. You're not going to be without shelter. I can guarantee that. But more importantly, God guarantees it. We have not missed a beat since we've been here. And I'm so grateful to the kingdom because that's why it's that way. It's because we're part of God's family and God's family take care of one another. We are so close. We take care of each other. We need to be wise. We need to be sacrificial like the wise men were in the scripture that Andrew shared. It's just amazing to see how God can work, but you need to have faith. You need to trust in God in order to see it happen because without trust, you're not willing to do it. So thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing that incredible message. I am so excited. I'm so fired up to know that God is with us, that we are part of God's family and we take care of one another within that family because God loves us and we love God and people. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, today. And we're so grateful to God and his wonderful, amazing kingdom. To God be the glory. We have one more song. Have an incredible Sunday. We love you and praise be to God. Amen. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald Angel sing glory to the newborn king. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Filled in flesh and God had seen, held in carnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven born prince of peace, hail the son of righteousness, light and light to all. All he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lay his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king.